I'm James, and these are eight decorating mistakes that I see happen a lot. So I'm gonna help you avoid them. Now, even though we are the paint people, subscribe if you're new. We talk about decorating and design as well. And we're gonna leave paint out of this video because I do think there are so many different aspects of designing your home other than paint colors. And being a member of this online design community, I do see a lot of things. I see a lot of things that kind of irk me a little bit. I'm always angry. The thing is, I love mistakes because you learn from them. And hopefully those experiences aren't too expensive. And right off the bat, if you are one of those super eccentric design people that are maximalist and there are no rules, then you can just ignore this video. Because personally, I think there are some rules in design. And I also think it's okay to break those rules, especially if you're doing it knowingly. If you're aware of the rules, then you can break them. Whatever you do, don't make this first mistake, okay? Don't lose sight of the room that you're designing. And what I mean by that is, what is the space in your home that you're working with? What are you gonna use it for? Let that inform what you do with it. Don't put your sofa in your kitchen. Don't put a dining room table in your hallway. These examples may seem crazy to some of you, but it's really illustrating my point. If you're designing a space that you wanna relax in, for example, like a family room, a living room, even a bedroom, then try and fill it with things that relax you, like a nice comfy sofa, a beautiful chair, maybe some mementos from home that really are nostalgic and warm your heart. Things like that. On the flip side, if you're decorating an office or a study space, maybe you wanna design it in a way that is energetic and thought provoking and is conducive to a healthy work environment because you wanna get stuff done. You don't wanna take a snooze while you're supposed to be making that money, honey. And don't just think of the vibe and the purpose of the room, but also the usability of that room. Don't neglect walkways and how you're actually going to be using that space and maneuvering around it. Hallways are an obvious one. You don't wanna put obstructions all over the place, but even within a living room, a dining area, all that, you wanna be able to move around and get from point A to point B to point C, whatever. So make sure everything is spaced accordingly and not filled with stuff where you just can't move at all. The second decorating mistake I see is random pieces, random furniture, random accessories, just an amalgamation of all of the things. And I know this is kind of hard once you get older and you've had time to accumulate a lot of stuff and you just feel compelled to use it all. You don't need to use it all. You know, you do need to edit a little bit here and there. I find the easiest way to go about things, especially if you're starting from scratch, is stick with one style. Stick with a design style that you really like and maybe have liked for a while. So hopefully it'll stand the test of time. So if you gravitate towards minimalism, well, that's easy. You just don't need anything at that point. But seriously, maybe a Scandi design, Japandi, Bohemian, farmhouse, whatever the case may be, let that be your guide. If you find a style you like, then you can work within that style. You know, you can sort of divvy it up a little bit. You can go 70, 30, 80, 20, if you want to incorporate a little bit of another style just to add some intrigue. That's always fun too. But the overarching theme should be tied to some form of structure. And you can do that by sticking with a style. Next up we have is matchy matchy. So this is a bit of a hot debate between my wife and I. Um, we recently bought our bedroom furniture and she was all about just get the matching set. You know, the dresser, the night tables, the, the everything. And I was more like, oh no, why don't we just hand pick and curate stuff that we like and then sort of go from there. Well, we had to compromise. So what we ended up doing was a little bit of matchy matchy with the dresser and the night tables. And then the other furniture pieces were a little more unique although they still fit the overall theme, they use similar materials. So I think, you know, we kind of both won in that circumstance. So you don't have to always feel like you need everything to match perfectly, right? As long as it fits that style, that theme, if you kind of work within it, but sort of divvy things up, that adds more character, it's a more interesting space, and it can create nice little focal points that can draw your eye in the best possible way. If everything is from the same exact set and matching, I guess it's simple, but 
we don't like simple. Simple's boring, right? If you're going to match anything, match stylistically is what I'm getting at. The next mistake is the obsession with symmetry. And this is a tricky one to navigate sometimes. We like symmetry as human beings. We like things to be nice and balanced. I'm a Libra, so I'm all about that. But when everything is too perfectly symmetrical, that also can be a bit boring, not as interesting as maybe some asymmetrical elements. And in fact, we had to face this head on when we were finding a shelving unit or some storage next to our fireplace mantle because we needed to store our TV console and my game console and some little trinkets here and there, and it needed to fit. And we found something that was perfect. It was white and everything else was white. It just looked nice, but it was also very kind of oblong and <laughs> geometric. And my immediate impulse was to buy two and then get the other one on the other side. I didn't have anything to put it on the other side, but I told myself, oh, I'll figure it out later. I gotta have that symmetry, that symmetrical kind of thing. No, you don't. You don't always need that. And in fact, now that I have this asymmetrical look, it really works for me. And I'm able to then divvy things up on that other side to really create my own vision of what I like and what I feel works. And I also saved a lot of money because I only needed to buy one shelving unit. Now, a big part of that sort of shelving unit that worked really well was I avoided another big mistake and I hid the wires on all of those little gadgets and gizmos I had. You gotta hide those wires. If you see exposed telephone wires and speaker wires flying all over the place, as a designer, when you see telephone wires hanging down and speaker wires going across and even along the floor underneath the rug and you see this little mound. Like, it just ruins any good design. It's something so small that has a pretty big impact because it is clearly a practical thing, a wire, right? It's not a design choice. There are no beautiful looking wires out there. They're meant to be hidden or concealed the best way you can. And there's many ways you can do this, right? If you're lucky enough to arrange your furniture in places that can naturally be in front of wiring, all the best. But if you're like me and got an open back shelving unit, then you gotta do some cable management. So you can get Velcro, you can get tape, you can get little clips to sort of hide those wires so they're not in plain sight. And then of course, the number one way to do it is to feed the wires into the wall, which sounds very daunting. You do not need to be a licensed electrician to do this. Just check YouTube. I'll leave a link actually down below of a really great tutorial of how to hide your TV wires behind your wall. It makes such a difference. But that being said, one thing that you don't wanna hide is the character of your home. And I find a big mistake that people make, especially if they have older homes, is they fail to accentuate their home's character. Now, if you own a home that's older than mine, because mine's only like four years old, you may have some unique characteristics, like your crown molding is more intricate, you higher ceilings, you got those beautiful ceiling medallions with the chandelier, spindles might be really cool. A lot of aspects of older homes just don't exist in modern homes. Why not accentuate those things? I'm assuming if you bought that property, you appreciated the history behind it and the character of it. So ways you can draw attention to those things is with color and with finish as well. So you can decide to paint those colors with something different to sort of draw your eye, or if you wanna keep it more uniform, you can adjust the finish. So maybe on the crown molding, you go with a higher gloss. So it'll really reflect the light nicely and it'll almost glow. It's a wasted opportunity if you just wanna like let it blend in with everything else, in my mind. Otherwise, just get rid of it, you know? We gotta talk about lighting, okay? Enlighten yourself on lighting. Do not ignore the power of good lighting. So if you're blessed with natural light, if you have a lot of really big windows and a beautiful exposure from the sun, that's great. If you don't, you can still leverage artificial lighting like I have in my studio here. There are many different ways to utilize light, starting with color temperature. So if you're not familiar, lighting can be warm, it can be cool, and it's notated by something called Kelvin a Kelvin value. And the lower that value is, the more warm and orange that lighting is. And then as it gets higher, it gets closer to daylight or sunlight. And then it goes through a spectrum of white lighting and then gets blue. It just gets so intense and bright and blue. And what's great is you can use both types of light in your home. Typically incandescent bulbs from the olden days, what I grew up using, those are the warmer lights, right? They don't produce a ton of output. They're not gonna be very bright, but they're cozy. They're fun, they're, you know, nostalgic in a way. And then you have your more modern bright lights that are really high output, really bright, white, 
a little more neutral, I guess you could say. And I think both have their place. I tend to use warmer lighting in areas that I want to feel more cozy and home like, especially in accent lighting, like floor lamps and all that. And then where I want a lot of light, where I want to focus, when I want to really be engaged, like in a space like this, then I opt for the brighter LED white lights. Some quick pros and cons of both. Incandescent lights tend to be way less efficient. They run hotter, they don't last as long. But what's nice is you can buy modern LED lights that replicate that incandescent look. And that's what I use in all of my floor lamps, essentially. It looks warm and cozy, but it's efficient and bright. So I appreciate that. Cause I mean, what's the point of having an awesome design if you can't see anything, right? So I gotta say though, one of the biggest mistakes I see is people follow trends and not their hearts. And we talked all about it in this video here. A bit of a rant, I will say, but there's a lot of important information here that I think you'll get a lot from. 